Gospel of Mark, chapter number one again. And I want to read to us from verses 23 until verse 34. And in the early worship, we talked about the preaching of the Christ. In this worship, I want to preach about the power of of the Christ. In the Gospel of Mark at chapter 1 commencing in verse 23. And there was there in the synagogue a man with an unclean spirit and he cried out saying let us alone what have we to do with thee thou Jesus of Nazareth art thou come to destroy us I know thee who thou art the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Hold thy peace, and come out of him. And when the unclean spirit had torn him and cried with a loud voice, he came out of him. And they were all amazed, insomuch that they questioned among themselves, saying, What thing is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority commanded he even the unclean spirits, and they do obey him. And immediately his fame spread abroad throughout all the region round about Galilee. And forthwith, when they were come out of the synagogue, they entered into the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. But Simon's wife's mother lay sick of a fever, and anon they left him of her. And he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up, and immediately the fever left her, and she ministered unto them. And at even when the sun did set, they brought unto him all that were diseased, and them that were possessed with devils. And all the city was gathered together at the door, and he healed many that were sick of divers diseases, and cast out many devils, and suffered not the devils to speak, because they knew him. Thank you. You may be seated. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. For just a moment, I want to examine this, this unusual power of our Lord While he's in the synagogue, he's preaching like one who has authority. They are amazed. They are astonished. Their mouths drop open because they've never encountered one like Jesus. They've listened to the dry and dusty sermons of the rabbis and the, the priesthood. They've endured, endured long, boring soliloquies, speeches of one rabbi quoting another rabbi. But Jesus stands up in their midst and preaches with power and authority, contextually, with character, and with content, so that they are amazed at his words. But to even further demonstrate who he is, three things happened in this passage from verses 23 through 34 to show us that Jesus has all the power. Walk with me around the text. And they went into Capernaum while he was preaching there in the synagogue. 
And the scripture says, while he was still in the synagogue, there came among them one possessed by the devil. A man with an unclean spirit. Now many in that day uh, believed that uh, people were mentally unstable and not really demon possessed. They had some mental challenge or some psychological maladjustment. But the Bible calls it demon possession. And brothers and sisters, you hear me today, there are still people among us now who are possessed of the devil. Because if you are not a believer, you are subject to do anything. And the devil can so possess you that you do irrational things, not only to yourself, but to other people. Uh, these young men who bombed that marathon the other day, that's demon possession. Uh, this rash of murders here in Houston and the women can't be out in the street at night for fear of being raped, that's demon possession. Children who cannot obey their parents, who cannot say yes ma'am or no sir, who cannot be controlled or contained, that's possession by the devil. Talk back to me if you can. The devil will take control where there is no Christ. Where there's no Savior, where there is no Lord, Satan comes in to take control. And if you run him out without calling Christ in, he will come back with demons seven times stronger than the ones who left. When you don't know Jesus Christ, you are subject to be controlled by the devil. This unclean spirit had so possessed this man that it brought him to the church. That's a word to us this morning. Uh, that even the unclean spirit in that man drove him to the church. Uh, he was out of his mind. He was controlled by the devil. Jesus didn't run him off. Jesus didn't put him out. Jesus let him in because he knew what the man's problem was. And Jesus, this morning, still has power over demons. Uh, let's, 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 let's walk around the text. Let's, let's, let's look at what the scripture says. Here they are in this place. Here they are with these demons. And the demons know who Jesus is. They say, let us alone. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Verse 24, art thou come to destroy us? And listen at this word of praise. I know who you are. You are the Holy One of God. But Jesus says, hold your peace. I don't want praise from a devil. I wish I had my 730 cry. That, that word, hold your peace, means Jesus said, be muzzled. Don't you praise me, Satan. I don't want to get praise from a devil. I want to get praise from one who the devil had possessed that I redeemed. I wish I had somebody to help me right here. You missed that. When the devil praised them, Jesus said, be muzzled. Hold your peace. Don't praise me. I don't want praise from the devil. I want praise from one who's been perfected from the devil. Y'all still miss that. I don't 
want the devil to praise me. Hold your peace. Be muzzled. Don't say another word of praise because you are a demon. I want one who used to be possessed. I'm going to run that by you one more time. Jesus is not looking for praise from the devil. Jesus is looking for somebody who's been delivered to give him some praise. And there ought to be somebody in here right now who used to be possessed. I wish I had a witness here. You, you had a drinking demon. You had a lying demon. I wish I had one or two more believers. You had a demon that kept you out all night long. You had a demon that wouldn't let you praise God. But since God has delivered you, he does not want praise from the devil, but from one who's been delivered. Uh, folk who've been delivered have no problem giving God praise. Because you're so glad to come out from under that stronghold that had you bound that you don't mind giving God praise. I wish I had one or two more witnesses. Some of y'all kind of stiff right now. I, I know you, you, you haven't had any big sins that you can really look at and claim, but, but some of us got some big stuff that we've been delivered from that the Lord brought us through. And if God hadn't stepped in, we would have gotten killed or we could have gone to jail or, or we could have lost everything we had. But God stepped in right on time and we've been delivered. And you think we're going to let you or you or somebody over here tell us you're making too much noise? The Lord don't want praise from a demon. He wants praise from somebody who's been delivered. And if you've been delivered, don't let anybody muzzle your praise. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Now he wants to muzzle the devil yes, but not the delivered. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got it. And if you've been delivered yeah. it don't even have to be Sunday morning. No, I wish I had some help here. You don't even have to be in Lily Grove. If you've been delivered if the answer comes on a Wednesday you ought to give God some praise. If God brings you out on Saturday morning, they ought to know on your street that somebody in that house been delivered. Yeah. He has power over demon. But then the text says he has power over minor disruption. Because when he got through preaching, he went to Simon Peter's house. And at Simon's house, his mother-in-law had a fever. A fever that kept her in bed. And when Jesus got to the house and Simon Peter's mother-in-law had a fever, he just took her by the hand and the fever left him. Now, that's, that's, that, that seems minor and inconsequential. But that says to us that there is no disruption, no detail too small for Jesus. Getting rid of that demon from that man was a big thing. Relieving Peter's mother-in-law of a fever was a little thing. But God takes care of big things and little things. Sometimes we don't want to bring our little stuff to Jesus. But Jesus is concerned about your little problems. Now, now listen. If he can run out a demon, he certainly can get rid of a fever. See how quiet you got right there? That reminds me of, um, of Elijah in the Old Testament 
we need to challenge the prophets of Baal and the Grove prophets to come in and meet him in a challenge at Mount Carmel. And God answered by fire. And Elijah stood up to 850 prophets. And one woman named Jezebel made him run for his life. Stay with me now. If God can help you against 850, God sure can take care of one. See how quiet y'all got right there? There's no minor thing in your life that's too small for Jesus to take care of. If he can take care of demons out of a man, surely he can relieve this woman of a fever. And the scripture says, after Jesus touched her and put his hands on her, she went in the kitchen and ministered unto them. Now that's a small thing. That's nothing. She just got in the kitchen and got some food on the table. But that never would have happened had she not been relieved of that fever. Jesus took care of that minor disruption so that she could be a blessing to him. And God will handle the minor disruptions in your life because there's nothing that concerns you that he will overlook. He takes care of the smallest detail. You don't have to take my word for that. The Bible says the very hairs on your head have been numbered. Now, if God takes time to number the hairs on your head, and the next time you comb your hair, some hair will be left in the comb, which means he's got to start counting all over again. And if God takes care of so minute a detail as hairs on your head, anything, big or small, that comes up in your life, God can handle. Uh, I, I trust him in my car. I trust him when I'm on 16. I'm tr I trust him when I sit in the house by myself. I, I don't know who's thinking about breaking in on me. But he's got an angel stationed outside. Uh, he, he's got protecting angels. You, you don't know when you leave your house if you're going to get back the same way you left. But God has protecting angels. Somebody ought to help me preach it. When you got up this morning, you were feeling fine. But you don't know what's going to happen between now and the time you go to bed. God has already gone before you to move some stuff out of your way. He's already sped up some cars that were going to run into you on 45. He's already taken care of the small details in your life. He has power over demons. He has power over disruptions. But finally, he has power over diseases. Now, I want you to get this. Jesus healed many sick people. The scripture says he healed many sick people. Many sick people, meaning he didn't heal all the sick people. Because it's not always his will to heal. And you've got to be awfully mature to accept that he does not choose always to move the affliction. I wish I had somebody to help me testify right here. Uh, sometimes we misinterpret or misrepresent that passage of scripture in Isaiah chapter 53. It says, by his stripes, we are healed. And people use that to mean that he will heal you of every one of your sicknesses and every one of your problems and every one of your diseases. But it is not always God's will to heal. Sometimes sickness comes because of sin in your life. And then there are times when sickness comes when God wants to get glory over your situation. Let me see if I can help somebody right here. Uh, I will have to take medication for the rest of my life. The tumor that I have in my brain it has not gone away. It's minute, it's small, it's almost imperceptible uh, on the MRI, but I still have to take that medication for the rest of my life. 
it's a thorn in my flesh. Uh, I hate taking medication. I hate going to the drugstore. I hate standing in the line. Uh, I hate the pharmacist telling me, uh, give me your birthday. Uh, I hate going to the hospital and they ask me for my medical record number. I hate my doctor. Uh, I hate my physical therapist. I don't like nothing about this disease. But then the Holy Ghost uh, put in my spirit that, that every time I have to take this medication, it reminds me of my dependence on God. Because I love the Lord. I'm a Christian. I'm a preacher. But God has not chosen to remove the tumor. It's there for the rest of my life to remind me that if I'm going to preach his word, I got to lean on him. There are side effects to the medication. Uh, sometimes I get dizzy. Sometimes I have hot flashes. Sometimes I don't feel like it. But then his grace is sufficient. And even though he does not move the affliction, he gives me power in the midst of it. Somebody ought to help me preach right here. He may not get your daddy off his sick bed. He may not cure your mother of her disease. But if you got faith, God will help you go through the valley and the shadow of death. Lord, you don't have to move the mountain. Just give me the strength. I wish I had some noise right here. Somebody here is dealing with some problems in your family. Somebody here is taking care of an aging parent. And that's hard and tedious because there's a difference between visiting a sick person and taking care of a sick person. And you may have to do that for a long time. But God will strengthen you and get under your burden with you that you will be carrying it and the more you carry it the stronger you become you'll be able to praise God with louder hallelujahs you'll be able to raise God with your hands held up higher because God has victory over disease now hear me if he does not deliver in this life I'm trying to close this little sermon right here. If he does not choose to remove the affliction in this life, the Bible has a word for that. For we know, and I wish I had a witness, that all things work together for the good to them that love God and to those who are the called according to his purpose. You're going to help me close this, won't you? The Bible has another word for that. For we know that if this earthly house of this tabernacle is dissolved, we have another building. A house not made with hands, but it's eternal I wish I had a Bible reader. When I was a boy growing up in my little town, we used to sing, there's a leak in this old building and my soul has got to move. Before this time, another year, I may be dead and gone, but I'll let you know before I go, my soul has a brand new home. I'm not worrying about my afflictions on this side because Jesus is coming back again. He's coming to receive me unto himself. That where he is, I will be there also. So I've got to suffer a little while. I wish I had somebody to help me preach. I've got to cry a little while. I've got to go through it for a little while. But I know that weeping may endure for a night. But if I just keep the faith, if I just hold on to his hand, I know joy will come in the morning. Have I got a witness here? If I just keep on trusting in God, I can testify like the psalmist, the Lord is my shepherd. 
I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. I wish I had somebody who's been through it. Yea, though I walk through the valley and the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, and my cup is just running over. Surely, I wish I had some noise here. Surely, surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I wish I had another witness. I wish I had two or three more believers who know that even though God doesn't deliver on this side, there's a bright side somewhere. Moses said, Lord, thou has been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hast formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. Thou turnest man to destruction and sayest, Return, ye children of men, for a thousand years in your sight are but as yesterday, when it is past and as a watch in the night. You carry them away as a flood. They are as a sleep. In the morning they are like grass that groweth up. In the evening it flourisheth and groweth up. But it is soon cut down and withers away. Who knows the power of your anger? Even according to your fear, so is your wrath. So teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts under wisdom. Is there anybody here? No, it'll be over after a while. No more sickness in our family. No more dementia with our parents. No more problems with our children. No more suffering in our bodies. Every day will be Sunday and the Sabbath will have no end. Jesus is getting us ready for that great day. Is there anybody here getting ready for that great day? If the Lord opened doors for you, you ought to get ready to praise him. If the Lord made a way for you, you ought not need me to tell you to give him glory. If the Lord been smiling in your life, come on, help me give him thanks. Help me give him the praise. Help me give him the glory. He's got power over demons, power over disruptions, power over diseases. And finally, he's got power over death. Because one Friday on an old rugged cross, he died. Didn't he die? But bright early, bright early, Sunday morning, he got up. Why don't you grab somebody? Tell him early, Sunday morning, he rose. I know he's all right. got victory. I've got victory over every demon. Victory over every disruption. 
victory over every disease. And ultimately, I will have victory over death and the grave. Because I hear him saying in Paul's letter to the church at Corinth, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. For when this mortal has put on immortality, when this corruptible has put on incorruption, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death has been swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your sting? Grave, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin. And the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul says, therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. People may not appreciate what you do. People may not give you credit for what you've accomplished. But if you stay steadfast, always abounding in the work of the Lord, your labor is not in vain in the Lord. 